So Susan, the Thanks recording so much, is beginning. Diane. Okay, great. Thanks. I'd like to add my welcome to everyone joining the Engage webinar on improving faculty-student interaction. Uh, I'd also like to take just a few minutes to provide some context for today's presentation. So as you know, uh, research and researchers and educators have been studying student retention for decades. The reports and studies line bookshelves and take up space on computers. However, as you also know, there's often a disconnect between research and practice. That, that's where Engage comes into play. Uh, Engage is an extension service project funded by NSF's GSE program, which is directed by Dr. Jolene Jesse. Extension service projects are a very exciting and rather unique NSF program because the innovation is in the mechanisms and strategies that enable the research, in this case on retention, uh, to be extended to faculty and administrators at engineering schools to put into practice. We are working currently with teams from 10 engineering schools to implement three strategies that research indicates improves retention. Our focus is first and second year students because these students are the most vulnerable to switch out of engineering. We have also selected strategies that may disproportionately improve interest and engagement in engineering among women, but no doubt improve the undergraduate experience for all students. So the strategies, the engaged strategies, include assessing students' spatial visualization skills as freshmen and then providing curriculum to improve the skills of students who fall below a certain threshold. The second strategy is encouraging faculty to use and develop examples that are familiar and relevant to students to teach technical concepts in engineering, math, and science. And then the topic of today's webinar, strategy number three, enhancing the ability for faculty and students to interact in and out of the classroom. We'd like to take a second to just do a quick poll to find out who is on the call today. So if you could respond to the polling question and hit submit, it'll just take a second. And the answer is, So we have a lot of faculty, uh, which is terrific. Uh, all areas are represented. And then that other category, which always is interesting. Um, but certainly, having all the groups represented in your roles, you all have the opportunity to influence interaction between faculty and students. So that's terrific. With that said, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Carol Muller, who's our presenter today. A uh, little background on Carol. She's worked in higher education in many capacities. She served as the Associate Dean for Administration at Dartmouth Thayer School of Engineering, and then in 1996 launched and led for 12 years MentorNet, uh, which many of you may be familiar with. It's a nonprofit online global mentoring network serving engineering and science students and early career academic professionals. Carol was a consulting faculty member in mechanical engineering at Stanford, working on faculty development programs. And for the past year, she's been managing the Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford University. Carol, I'm handing the mic over to you. Thanks, Susan. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to join you today, even through this slightly or maybe more than slightly surreal interaction of the webinar. We're going to focus for the next 30 minutes or so not only on the importance of faculty-student interactions, but also on the opportunities that we have in abundance and ones that we could further exploit to take everyday teachable moments and use them for greater impact, as particularly for retention of first and second year undergraduates in engineering. These are what I'm calling the micro moments for mega results. I'm sure you've all heard the homily, if you keep on doing what you've always done, you'll keep on getting what you've always gotten. 
we're all here today to consider how we could do differently, but when it comes to faculty-student interactions, there are some pretty real constraints. We have a lot of students in engineering, and we have a lot to teach them. And yet, expectations for faculty and their diverse roles and responsibilities, the economics of higher education, facility limitations, all dictate some constraints on maximizing our interaction with students. Classes are, classes are often large, and opportunities for individualized or even small group work are limited. But there's still a variety of ways we can work in effective strategies to increase student engagement. This is the low-hanging fruit we're here to talk about today, simple small steps that practically any faculty member can take, which collectively can yield big results. When we look at the research on retention, there's one key strategy we see over and over again, mentoring. That's how I come into this discussion. But one of the things I want to ask is, are we really on the same page about what to do next? If you're carrying around a hammer or a knowledge base about effective mentoring, it can be really easy for every situation to look like a nail or tempting to apply mentoring as the solution to all retention problems. So I'd suggest we unpack this term mentoring a little bit more. There are complications in defining mentoring and establishing a normative plan of action, even if we've identified it as a key strategy. For one thing, mentoring is a multifaceted term, and it can be ambiguous. Faculty members and others typically uh, interpret mentoring as whatever they experienced as a student themselves, or maybe, <coughs> excuse me, whatever they wish they had experienced. In addition, it gets complicated because every individual might need something slightly different from beneficial mentoring, so the outcomes aren't at all uniform. And furthermore, faculty have legitimate concerns about being asked to do more mentoring than they're already doing. Let's talk a little bit about what those might be. And we actually wanted to take a quick poll to gauge your concerns about what might be some of the barriers to increasing mentoring opportunities for undergraduates. So there are potentially more than just these five uh, uh, barriers to implementation of more mentoring for undergraduates, but for the time being, let's take a quick gauge at what you all have indicated here might be problematic. So, oh, this is great. I love seeing this in real time. Uh, you can see from what we're seeing that Almost three-quarters of you indicate that time is a real limitation. <clears throat> we also have, <coughs> excuse me, I did have water here, but it's almost gone. Uh, faculty knowledge and understanding is another uh, potential d challenge here. Interest, available resources, and student interest. In a perfect world, every undergraduate would have the opportunity to engage in faculty-guided research as well as hands-on real-world engineering projects on a daily basis. We certainly see indications throughout that these are key activities in really engaging students in engineering and increasing their interest, their understanding, and their capabilities. But at this point, it's really only feasible to reach a small percentage of the population, even though these programs yield great results. Not only do faculty have limited time in research projects, but facilities constraints and required courses can get in the way of these opportunities. And in addition, it's important to recognize that not all undergraduate students are, are ready for, have the time for, or even want to participate in such intensive faculty-student interactions. So where does that leave us? How can we move beyond mentoring is whatever I did or didn't experience myself as a student and consider less intensive mentoring opportunities but still get some of the benefits? Looking at the components of mentoring can be helpful. So what we know from research on mentoring is that in the context of undergraduate student mentoring, there are three different kinds of activities that 
typically emerge. One is encouragement, which psychologists often call psychosocial or possibly socio-emotional support, or what we might just call plain old cheerleading. Um, another is information and advice, and sometimes we would call this career or career-related. It could also apply to academic programs. It doesn't have to be careers, literally, or the profession. And a third is championing or instrumental mentoring, the kind that you provide when you write a letter of recommendation or nominate a student for an award, for example. <clears throat> so if we keep looking at the research, we also see that it's quality and extent of faculty interactions that really make a difference. It's quite apparent that faculty interactions make a significant difference in student engagement and student success. And it's important to note that we're specifically talking about interactions with engineering faculty having more of an impact than even than positive interactions with other individuals, parents, advisors, staff, and others, because students perceive that it's the engineering faculty member who knows whether or not they have what it takes to be successful in engineering. Their encouragement is believable. Even very casual, brief conversations with faculty can motivate students, enhance learning, improve student performance, positively influence retention, and increase student commitment to engineering as a profession. So for example, a recent anecdote from a senior. During sophomore year, my professor stopped me on the way out of class and told me I did a great job on a lab report. That's such a typical kind of positive thing we often don't think about it. We might just happen to say it because we spot the student and think, oh yeah, that was a really good job and actually articulate it. But for this student, what did she, the first thing I did was call my mother. Weird to say, but that year I might have switched out of engineering if it wasn't for that comment. We each have stories like this. So often as faculty, we aren't fully aware of the impact of our interactions with students. But this example and many others like it show the profound effect that such a small thing can have. So the question is, how do we get this kind of result more often? And what we've done is to look at seven evidence-based, that is, you know, built on research and knowledge about what really works, low threshold, that is not very time intensive, easy to implement tactics, to increase positive faculty-student interactions. So let's take a look at the first one. Sharing an encouraging or informative message with students, even at about two minutes per week, maybe as an opening or closing message as a lecture. Why would we want to do this? Well, very often students may not seek out additional information after class because they feel intimidated or perceive the professors and TAs as too busy or have to rush off to their next obligation. And many students, particularly those from underrepresented groups, also spend time wondering if they made the right choice, whether or not they're welcome, do they fit in. As a result, a simple communication can function as a welcome and an invitation to persist in the field. Most people, most faculty, may not have time to encourage many individual students each day, but two minutes a week to reach an entire class is usually possible. So with that kind of an approach, you can reach many students instead of only the one that happens to snag you after class or the one you happen to see in the hallway. So some examples of how you might do this. You could provide an insider's perspective on a good opportunity, such as an activity that's coming up. You could provide some general encouragement or a word to the wise. Um, so you can see several examples here. Where number three, where it says one of my former students says that she uses what she learned in this class on a regular basis in her work. That's a positive encouragement connecting what's going on in the class to future practical uses. It could be even more uh, influential if you actually named the student. Uh, I was in a class earlier this week where the instructor actually had the opportunity to smile at the class and point to certain people and say things like, you're sitting where Jerry Yang sat when I taught him 10 years ago, you know, and you're sitting. So occasionally you can pull that up and it can be terrifically effective. Or you could simply say something like, I noticed that in Tom Friedman's latest op-ed, he makes a strong case for how those trained in engineering will be well prepared to help tackle some of these major global challenges we're facing. 
um, this really implants in the student's mind that you are, as a faculty member, are affirming that they are welcome and capable of succeeding in engineering. Let's move on to another tactic. Taking a minute to give constructive feedback on a test or a quiz in addition to the grade and, and asking your teaching assistants to do the same. The reason to do this is that students hear feedback in different ways. Often they're alone with a graded assignment exam or project or at least without feedback from the faculty member or TAs. So they, they get your feedback primarily through that grade or any other comments you might add. If you can add something beyond a grade, it helps expand the interpretation. It's also an opportunity, even through a word or two, to um, communicate confidence in the student as well as specific ideas about how and what to improve. So this builds on the understanding that expectations of students absolutely influence their performance. So it's critical to convey expectations that they will be able to learn. And as you'll see in the examples, it's very important to focus where remediation is needed on the actual activity that needs remediation or the piece of understanding rather than having it being interpreted as a critique of the person. So for instance, on a, an assignment that really didn't meet the grade, one could say this project includes many quantitative errors resulting in a low grade, but temper that by saying I'm confident you can do higher quality work. Just check your calculations carefully, or whatever the necessary message is. Specific feedback really helps. The students then feel energized to tackle the challenge if they think they can fix their work and strive for excellence. In contrast, if you don't get that kind of specific feedback, it's really deflating to wonder what was missing. And it often gets internalized as something's wrong with me rather than I'm, I just need to learn a little bit more to really grasp it. To save time, you could try a simple grading rubric like the example given here in number two, uh, or even consider developing a set of examples of typical errors paired with examples of better work without the errors to refer to in grading so that you can actually give a lot of specific feedback but in a, a very quick and efficient way. Or your TAs, again, could take this on. Another tactic, uh, again about communication, sending an email to connect with students between class meetings that provides useful information. The very fact that you reached out by sending the email coming from you, not a list serve, again conveys that sense of caring and implicitly an understanding that the student, your desires for the student to be successful and your belief is that uh, he or she can be. It doesn't have to take much of your time at all. Um, you can provide a lot of different kinds of information on a relatively consistent basis. So for example, uh, you could address the class about challenging coursework. Students often wonder if they're the only ones struggling with a current, certain concept. So by sending an email to the class, you can alert everyone to common trouble areas and ease their anxiety by noting that others are experiencing the same problems. It's also a good way to invite participation or remind students about an opportunity. For instance, in the class I'm teaching this quarter, I often send students information about upcoming seminars that I think might be of interest to them. The students appreciate that a faculty member shares a research or internship opportunity with them or steers them to a website of interest. It you know, could be an announcement about a scholarship, a contest, career guidance information. Uh, could even be something your TAs help you develop if, uh, you know, it helps save you time. You could make a Facebook group for your class as another way to post opportunities and depending on your university resources, of course, there may be uh, electronic uh, means that facilitate your communication via email with your class. Moving on to tactic number four. Showing that you're approachable when you see students during and outside of class. Conveying approachability can be as simple as using eye contact or saying hello in the hallway. Why would you do this? Well, most faculty feel pressed for time, and it's often not feasible to increase office hours. But during class or in the hallway or pathways or cafeteria, you can increase students' perception of your approachability 
and as a result, they're more likely to ask good questions and engage during the class. Having an approachable teacher contributes to a supportive climate for learning for all students, but especially for students from underrepresented groups. So if you rarely have time for questions, one way you might do this is leave three minutes at the end of class for students to write questions on paper or even submit them online. The method is effective without reducing lecture time significantly. You can skim for themes and target your next lecture accordingly or pass along the information to section TAs to guide their sessions. And when you ask for those questions, students feel valued. Again, they feel much more engaged, if you, even with this really small opportunity for a little interactivity. Another thing that's really helpful is to actually look at students when you lecture, lifting your eyes up or away from the blackboard, the whiteboard, the computer screen. And this is always a challenge because, you know, engineering faculty by nature, most of us are a bit on the introverted side. But you'll find if you actually look at different people in the eye as you go around the class, even if you do have to glance back and forth to your notes at times, it actually will make you livelier as well as engage them more. So it's really a win-win all around. Moving on to a fifth tactic, and you will get a, access to a list of these later, so I don't want you to worry we're moving too quickly. But um, encouraging students to meet with you during office hours and in comfortable settings. So meeting with small groups of students in public places is even an option as well. So why do we encourage this? Because students find that informal interaction powerful and they also, the opportunities foster the idea that faculty, and by the way engineers by proxy, are people too. So you're really making that very human connection. You care about how they're doing. You're invested in their success. And it's really OK for them to come just to meet you. Uh, they'll be more likely to get their questions addressed when they're in smaller group settings as well. So for example, how might you do this? You could schedule project teams to visit your office hours. And this might be particularly true if you're um, finding that you have office hours but nobody shows up, for example. Uh, you could also consider holding your office hours in a public setting, such as a table in the campus center, a drop-by place. Um, and that might make it easier for, and less intimidating for students to come by. With tactic number six, one of the things we want to recognize is that there are often times that students come to you for help or with questions that really aren't ones that you have to deal with or problems you have to solve or questions you have to answer. But if your answer is, no, I can't help you, it can be very demoralizing. So there are ways to find alternatives to saying no that are less discouraging and less easily misinterpreted. So if you could say, I'm not the one to ask about that, you can instead respond to say, that's a good question. So affirm their need to get an answer to the question. Um, and perhaps let me think of a good place to start, uh, even if you might refer them to someone else. A moment of interested reflection, just a, a portion of a second, goes a long way to encourage students. And it also gets them to where they can find the information or support they need. Rather than brush off the student, you could consider uh, alternatives that direct them to the right resource. But you could also think about this as a micro-mentoring opportunity of getting them to move a little bit from a state of high dependence to a state of greater independence, or, or independence by in phrasing your response in such a way that they'll think a little bit more next time about, oh, maybe there are some other ways that they could access the information needed themselves again, instead of just providing them with the answer, give them a little bit more of a, a global opportunity. So we move on to tactic number seven, which has to do with respect, challenge, and collaborative ways of engagement. And the reason for this suggestion, and again, based on the research, is that many students find that their class experiences are a window into a future engineering career. If we mirror in the classroom respect, challenge, and collaborative interactions, ways that people can respectfully disagree, 
but also affirming the value of each person's perspective and at least initial take on a problem, they're more apt to envision these qualities in the workplace and to want to pursue a career in the field, rather than feeling as if they're going to enter into a career that's always a battleground. So let's think of some examples of this. One of the most powerful and simplest but can be complicated as well is learning students' names and their correct pronunciation. It's not always easy to learn many new names at once, so there are a number of faculty who have developed tricks of the trade to help them learn the names of students, even in very large classes. These can range anything from a kind of Facebook website or their own personal uh, poster with, with photos and names. Um, but there are also things you can do in class to uh, emphasize people's names calling on them by name, and if you don't know it, asking the person to tell them their name. Anytime a student asks, asks or answers a question, ask them to give their name. Helps not only you, but everyone in the class learn more about one another and develop, again, that sense of community and engagement that really helps facilitate their learning. Your own effort to learn even a few of the names and how to pronounce them correctly can really help students feel more like individuals and respected in the classroom. Another thing you can do is use a student's name during a lecture. So you might, for instance, say, let's say we wanted to build uh, a certain kind of circuit or a bridge. You could say instead, let's say Jennifer wanted to build a bridge. When students feel the class is relevant, they're more likely to engage. It's, a, again, a very subtle thing, uh, plays on people subconsciously mostly, but it really helps the engagement. Facilitating small group interactions and considering modeling responsible ways to inter interact and disagree during the class and taking time to work on those responsible and respectful ways of working together can help everyone, men and women, people with all kinds of diverse backgrounds, learn how to challenge one another and at the same time learn more from one another. So I wanted to uh, summarize a little bit uh, where we've been with these seven suggestions or tactics and some parting thoughts for you uh, before we go into a question session. Faculty-student interactions are really powerful in influencing student engagement and learning. And though mentoring through research and project-intensive work yields great results, there are far less intensive strategies that can also be highly effective and really should be used all the time in complementary ways. Another point I'd like to make is that learning takes at least two. Considering ways to help students gain the understanding and skills to direct their own learning, that mentoring them from a state of great dependence to greater independence. For example, in the class I'm teaching this quarter, which is designed to introduce students to electrical engineering as a profession. I ask students to create their own meaningful assignments. This took a few of them a little aback at first because they weren't used to thinking creatively about what would be meaningful to me that I might want to learn. But from my perspective, it was just one more opportunity to get them to really think authentically about their own motivation, which at the end of the day is going to have to be their primary driver. And by the way, you might be interested to know that Engage, this project that has spawned this webinar, has launched a spin-off project they call Talk to Me, which is designed to help students think about how to proactively engage with faculty to enhance their own learning and success. So these can be two-way streets, and the more we reinforce that, I think the more the learning will be effective all around and the educational goals that we all have in mind will be reached. A final thought to leave you with is that all interactions influence. Let's make them positive. Because a concomitant caution with a bonus finding drawn, again, from research, from the organizational behavior literature in this case, is that losses are more painful than gains are good. In other words, the perhaps usually, I'm sure almost always, uh, inadvertent negative interactions actually have even greater impact on students than the positive ones. So making an effort to try to avoid those unintentional 
interactions that might be misperceived by students as someone who doesn't care, doesn't engage, isn't interested in them, not making eye contact, frowning when you don't have to be frowning but could be smiling, even though you're distracted by something else, can also have a big influence. So it's definitely worth the effort to try to think about all the different ways we engage with students. They don't have to add more time. We can just slightly shift the quality. We pour a huge amount of time and energy into teaching, and we wouldn't want those efforts to go for naught. So I hope I can leave you with the thought that micro moments for mega results can be a really fun challenge. What did I do today to encourage a student? And I'd be happy to now respond to some of the questions if some have emerged. So Susan, can you let us know? I will, Carol. Thanks so much. Um, one of the things that came up, actually, which might be a tip for people, for faculty who are teaching distance learning uh, students, is also to think in terms of these tactics, some of them anyway, to engage distance learning students, which is an interesting twist on what you're talking about. Uh, one if of the questions I, that came up. I was just going to say, if I could just comment on that. Sure, I, of course. I, I think probably most people working in a distance learning environment have adapted many of these already, but I, th I think from personal experience working in an online environment uh, and through MentorNet and so forth, too, and the research we did with that, one of the things that really helps there is, you know, to uh, build that individual one-on-one -on -one communication with a student in addition to whatever's going on in the class. So it's harder to use non uh, verbal cues the way we can in a face-to-face -face setting to help people feel included, welcomed, and fully integrated into the class, but just things like using their individual names. Hopefully the technology enables you to send out emails that can be addressed to a, an individual and really makes it feel as if you're engaging them one-on-one -on -one because that's part of, I think, what in an online environment would help pull in some of these results, too. A couple of the other questions involves assessment. Uh, how would you assess the impact of improved faculty-student interaction if faculty started doing more of this in and out of the classroom? And a follow-up to that is how could this be done through current uh, faculty uh, teacher evaluation? Well, I, I think you have a couple of things going on there with assessment and remembering that assessment is both formative and summative. That is, we're looking at both getting quick feedback on what's working and what's not, as well as an evaluation of how well did this person do in the long run. I would definitely encourage people to find ways of getting feedback as they employ some of these techniques if they're not already using them across the board. You know, simple thing is just to ask, and again, don't use real time-consuming ways because our classes, after all, are about transmitting a lot of information, engaging students with the content of the technical curriculum. But you can, for instance, have a quick hands raised, hands lowered at any point during the session to get some quick feedback. You could also pass around index cards. There are higher tech ways of doing this, too. And maybe just ask a question, you know, uh, how, how engaged did you feel in this particular lecture today? Or what question is left unanswered for you? Or what part of this class did you find most interesting? So this is uh, it's another way of, of getting assessment and getting that engagement at the same time. So it's kind of a win-win. If you're, you could also ask more direct questions, you know, how confident, especially if you want to do some kind of pre-assessment at the beginning of the class, how comfortable you're currently feeling with your choice of taking this class or of majoring in this field or, um, you know, and give them a range of answers if you want a real quick questionnaire will give you a lot of information. It, it can just be one question if you want to. And then TAs could collect those, or you can collect them and scan them, get some quick feedback. Um, I think most of our standardized uh, course evaluation forms will end up collecting some kind of data about 
uh, how approachable the student finds the instructor to be, the extent to which they felt their questions got answered. You know, every instrument varies a little bit, but you would ideally be able to see those results going up if there had been a change in behavior on the instructor's part. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, and again, using those, those quick responses um, through index cards or other little forms of gathering information from everyone in the class uh, sooner rather than waiting till the end of the course is a great way to go. Some of the course software uh, that people use to support their classes have easy ways to send a quick poll out to the class, so that's another possibility. Carol, one of the other participants uh, was looking for some tips that you might be able to offer faculty for differentiating instruction uh, when the spectrum of students involves both remedial and honors students, and maybe in addition, possibly differentiating the type of interaction that you might have with the spectrum of students. Well, I think in any class, any instructor has the challenge of working across a range of student backgrounds and, and capabilities. And one of the realities of the world when students graduate and go out is that they will be working with all kinds of different people and people bring different strengths to every aspect of their work. So I, I personally think this is a really important thing for them to learn. I think some of the pairing strategies, and I know you'll get into classroom strategies to a greater extent with some of the later webinars, but the pair-share kinds of things or um, the kinds of things where you pose a question about a concept to the class that you want to make sure everyone understands. You might give them uh, a question, it's even an either or, but is only going to um, give them a response. That, that for some people, if they haven't clearly understood the concept, they might be on the fence and ask them to pair up with someone in the class to answer the question. And then they'll find if and they don't have to move around or anything. You can do this pretty quickly. So it can just be the person next to you. Uh, here's the question. Talk with your neighbor. And what do you agree is the correct answer? Or if it's a more open-ended question, they might report back. But on nuances of a, a case or something like that. But that way, you can share information. You can actually have the students who know a little bit more um, contributing to the learning of those who may not be quite up to speed. Um, there, are, there are other strategies too, of course, encouraging people to use teaching assistantships, special class sessions or TA sessions to help them get up to speed on certain concepts. So we might be straying a little bit from student-faculty interaction in this case, but I think there are any number of techniques that can be used to address that range. Uh, the important thing with respect to student-faculty interaction, I think, is to uh, honestly convey your expectation that every student can learn the material. And if you have any reason to doubt that, it's good to think about whether or not is there something about that particular student in that class? Do they not take the prerequisite courses? Do they need to get some special study skills? And really advise them um, about how they could get there. Because oftentimes, um, confidence and a question of confidence can masquerade as inability. And you want to make sure that you're not um, confusing the two. Carol, before I ask the next question, there are a number of participants have asked about studies. Uh, supporting some of the things that we've talked about. And I just want to mention that the Engage website, and I'll show you a snapshot of that uh, particular page in a couple of minutes, has a research brief, many studies associated with this particular topic. And the WePan Knowledge Center, uh, which Diane mentioned at the beginning, has a whole host of searchable um, topics related to this. So you could check both. In terms of uh, the next question, how do you get the student who doesn't want to be engaged? So for example, the student who you know is, is a good student and has potential, 
uh, but seems to be faltering and is not responsive when you reach out or chooses to skip class or ignores emails. Um, any ideas about that? <laughs> well, it, I think it depends on the degree because, as I mentioned, learning takes two. Now, there can be all kinds of circumstances uh, and a whole variety of scenarios that might lead you to a situation where you find a student, despite your best efforts, is truly not responding. And I, I guess for me as an instructor, I would want to feel as if, as if I had at least made the effort and if, in fact, despite my attempts to talk to the student, maybe send them individual email, perhaps ask the TAs if they've had any better luck connecting with them, the student still seems completely unresponsive. I'd be inclined to ask if there's something else going on that maybe needs some attention. And usually most of our campuses have student services people, counselors, or others who, who have good ways of looking into those matters, but you're kind of getting, I, I would argue, a little bit beyond what you are obligated to do and maybe even what your your area of expertise is if you've made a good faith effort and you know you have and you're still not getting a response. So this next you know, life happens really get... to, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say life happens to students as well as to other people. So there could be, as I say, a number of logical explanations for why you're not getting a response. But if, they, if they're opting not to choose those with you, you just want to make sure that they're getting the support they need elsewhere because it's perhaps the case that, uh, you know, something completely different is occupying more of their time and energy and focus at this point. And your obligation as a faculty member is really to the best of your ability to help them be successful in the class and the curriculum. But beyond that, you've kind of done what you can do. So this next question gets to the core of what Engage is trying to do and is, is a challenging one. Uh, how can we encourage colleagues to take an interest in their own teaching, especially if they're not aware of what they might be doing wrong? Ah, a good question. Well, some of this motivation, I think, at some level has to be intrinsic. But I've certainly noticed a lot of um, copycat activity. So I think the challenge to start, you know, if you're a faculty member yourself, is probably with you. And then with just sharing in a, hey, I tried this. It was really fun. It worked. Um, and see if anybody else is interested. Because in my experience, you can't mandate these kinds of strategies. You can only show what works. And if you suddenly get, or not suddenly, but if you're getting better teaching evaluations, if more of the best students flock to work with you, um, people are aware of that. And they'll, you know, our faculty are competitive after all. Whether or not they have many other demands on their time, they may actually be interested in the kinds of things that um, you, you're doing that engenders that sort of response. I think too often some faculty think that good teaching is something you're either born with or not. I've heard faculty say that. And we really need to help dispel that myth. Uh, teaching is something that you can work on. It can be creative. It can be fun. It can be challenging. And it doesn't have to take a huge amount of time. It can very much dovetail with your existing work. In fact, sometimes some of these strategies will make your life a lot easier if students are more successful, more likely to turn in their work on time, more likely to ask questions early rather than waiting till there's a huge problem down the road. Another thing um, that some you might do is invite a colleague to sit in on your class and give you feedback. So it's a good way of um, getting some assessment. Um, you could even, if you want, ask them to imagine themselves as sort of a reluctant undergraduate who's just exposed to this class or the engineering curriculum for the first time and is pretty hesitant to engage. And just ask them to make notes of what they think you did that either helped the student, the you know, supposed student, feel welcome 
or maybe discourage them. And you might get some really good feedback, but you'll also um, start planting those ideas in your own colleagues' minds. So those are a few thoughts. Um, I'm sure this group could probably contribute many more, so perhaps it's, that's a, a whole topic for a future webinar because you're really talking about a kind of change process that I think many, many people are interested in. How can they contribute to it? And for me, it's really about making the scholarship of teaching and learning part of our ongoing activities and more of what we share in a community uh, of scholars along with the you know, what constitutes traditional research. I think some of our professional associations have done a nice job, too, of creating at least interest groups within their professional meetings, which are typically research presentations, but of opportunities for people to share more about their teaching. Um, but, but I do think it, it tends to be very much a peer-to-peer -peer influence that's the most successful. So if you can start with those if you're not a faculty member and you want to help encourage this, I think the way to do it is to ask those who are already starting to engage or have been using these kinds of strategies, what more, if anything, you can do to support them in doing these and in order to help them share those effective strategies with their colleagues. Carol, I'm going to thank you again. There are a number of other questions and we won't have time to answer all of them but we promise to do so uh, offline. I would like to just take a couple of minutes to show you where you can find some of the resources that Carol has been referring to and um, some of the next steps. This is a uh, snapshot of the faculty student interaction page on the Engage website and you can get to it by going to uh, the home page engageengineering.org and clicking on strategies. So, all of the information Carol has been talking about and more can be found on this page. Uh, Carol was also referring to a program called Talk to Me, which is the student's perspective of uh, how they engage with faculty. And that is also on the page uh, towards the bottom. It's a PowerPoint presentation for a group of students as well as handouts. And it helps prepare them to better engage faculty in an appropriate way since this can also be very intimidating for students. Um, Engage has been working with a great group of people from uh, 10 inaugural schools who've come up with a variety of approaches to implement the Engage strategies. Uh, best practices will be compiled in January and disseminated shortly thereafter. Ten more schools will join Engage formally uh, in December and an additional ten in 2012. Although we're formally working with a set of schools, all engineering schools have access to materials and support in terms of technical assistance from Engage staff and consultants. So please contact me if you're interested in exploring any of this further. And finally, since we're running out of time, uh, just to mention that part two of the three-part Engage webinar series is scheduled for December 2nd at 2 o'clock Eastern, where Ian Patterson will be talking about another Engage strategy, which is using everyday examples and engineering in the classroom. And finally, uh, Carol, thank you so much again for presenting uh, the webinar today and on behalf of WePen and Engage for everyone who's attended today, uh, we will email you the PowerPoint. Uh, we will email you the link to the recorded webinar that you can share with colleagues. And if you gave us your address when you registered, you'll be receiving copies of the Taking Action 1 and 2 that details effective ways to interact with students through written and spoken uh, communication that you can pass along to your faculty colleagues. And don't forget to sign up for uh, more webinar notifications at the WePan Knowledge Center. So thanks again, everyone, for attending. We'll be answering questions offline. And uh, have a good day. <laughs>